When I was at school, I had to study the novel by Charles Dickens, Great Expectations. I drew myself a map showing how all the characters were connected with each other. And what I found fascinating about this map was how the central character, Pip, was embedded in a web of relationships that affected what happened to him, although he couldn't perceive them until the end of the novel. I now know that what I was drawing was a network. In fact, I was drawing a social network. And I've since discovered there's a whole body of evidence about how our social networks affect our thinking, our behavior, our likes and dislikes, our happiness, our loneliness, even our body size. Today, I want to talk about how your social network impacts you, but I also want to talk about how you can influence people through your network, because I think leaders of the future will have a much more sophisticated understanding of networks and how to use them to generate ideas, to spread ideas, and to make ideas stick. I think we're at a, point, a very interesting point in terms of thinking about our networks, and the reason I think that is because of applications like this. This application is called TouchGraph. You can access it straight from Facebook. You give it your Facebook password. It will look at all your friends, and it'll figure out who is connected to who. And based on that, it'll draw you a network like this, which is color-coded according to clumps of people who all know each other. It's up to you to decide what those clumps represent. Now, the thing about this is it gives us an oversight of our networks in a way that's not been really possible before and that it can enable you to spot connections between people in different social groups that you might otherwise have been unaware of. So tools like this make it possible for us all to be network scientists. But if we're going to be network scientists, then we really need some bases, some rules for how to think about them. And what I want to talk to you today is about layers in your network and also to get you to think about the structure of your social network. And when I say social network, I'm talking about your social world. So I'd like to include within that, yes, the people that you are linked to on Facebook, but also other people in your lives, siblings, relatives, parents, teachers, maybe. Just think of your social world in a really inclusive sense. Before I go on, I want to ask you a question. How many of you here have more than 150 friends on Facebook? Uh, from what I can see, that's about 90%. I want to tell you about some research by an anthropologist called Robin Dunbar. He and other researchers have looked at the social organization of human societies. And they argued that we, relative to other species, we are very, very sophisticated in the way that we cooperate. And what's different about us is that we not only think about our relationship with our friends, or other people in our social group, but we also think about the relationship between others in our social group. Other species don't do that, and that's what's made us able to cooperate in the way that we do. But our brains, although much more sophisticated than other species, have only evolved to cope with group sizes of about 150. And if you think about it, if our brains are about not only thinking about our own connections, but the connections between people we know, that's going to put um, some constraints. As you increase your group size, that increases exponentially the number of ties between other people in your groups that you might have to stay in, in touch with to keep track of. And so what they say is 150 is the natural organizing number, which we find still possible to, to know everybody meaningfully as a person. And this number 150, it's become known as Dunbar, Dunbar's 150 number, is found in all sorts of areas of life. It's found in primitive societies where they operated in units of 150. It's found in military organization. It's found in business. The Gore-Tex company, for example, famously, every time a business unit gets to the number 150, rather than allowing it to get larger and having to put in more rules and structure, they create a new business unit because I think it's more productive to have people cooperating informally rather than creating lots of hierarchy and bureaucracy. Interestingly, now even with social networks, there's been some research looking at Twitter, showing that even if people have masses of followers and if, even if they follow huge numbers of people, when you look at who people actually converse with and have two-way conversations with, the number averages around 150, suggesting that naturally our brains still are geared towards keeping abreast of about 150 relationships. Within that 150, though, there is uh, some structure, some layers. And Dunbar suggests that these different layers 
vary in terms of the emotional intensity with which we have um, relationships with people. So he suggests there's a core, a clique, a camp, and what I'm calling a crowd. If we think about the core first, those are your three, maybe five closest relationships. People who you spend a lot of emotional energy with, people you turn to in times of trouble, when you're really anxious about something or something bad happens, those are the people you turn to. Add to that another 10 or so, and you get your clique. That's your 15 people who you're most visibly known to be associated with. So those probably are the people whose walls you post on on Facebook, who's, who tag you in photos and so on. Those are the ones that people know you, you hang out with. The next number up, though, the camp, is the interesting one. The anthropologists don't have very much to say about the camp, other than that it was that communities tended to camp overnight in this kind of number, 50. I think the camp's interesting because, by, by my reckoning, 50 must be the maximum number of people whose ideas, whose lives, whose daily interactions you can keep abreast of. And likewise, 50 is probably the maximum number of people who are going to be paying attention to what you have to say, because let's face it, attention is our scarce resource and we use it wisely. I don't think you pay attention to more than 50 people and their goings on, even within this larger group of 150. So the camp are going to be the people who listen to you. And if you want to be a leader in the future, and if you want to influence and change people's lives, you need to think carefully about who's in your camp. And it matters not only who's in it, but also it matters about the structure of the relationships in the camp. So here I'm going to move on to some work from sociology, from a guy called Mark Granovetter and others, who look at the structure and the patterning of social life. I want to illustrate this with a homework example. If you are in a group of people, like the one on the right-hand side, people who are close-knit, who spend a lot of time together, if everyone in your group thinks it's normal to do three hours of homework every night, and you only do half an hour, the likelihood is that their norms for homework will start to rub off on you, and you'll start to think, maybe I ought to be doing a bit more. On the other hand, if you're only weakly tied to another group, like the dotted line, their norms for what's, what's acceptable for homework are less likely to influence you because you spend less time with them. And these dotted lines are weak ties, and they have been shown to be very important for creativity for generating ideas. So when you think about your, the structure of your layers, if you have a structure like the one at the top, that's going to be fabulous for generating a rich array of insights from different perspectives. And if you accept the fact that creativity comes from being able to combine things in novel ways, then actually this is really important for creativity and for spreading ideas. On the other hand, if you're in a group like the one at the bottom, that's going to be great for the sharing of ideas and especially for making ideas stick. Because if you can influence, if you're in that group, and you change your behavior, the likelihood is that your, your fellows will follow what you're doing. So the top structure is great for spreading ideas. The bottom one is great for making them stick. To illustrate this idea of how your, this uh, notion of how your ideas spread out to other people, I just want to show you this um, animation from Google+, Plus, which is showing a post someone put out a few weeks ago, a beautiful picture of the moon to cheer up your weekend. And you can see how his original post spread out to other circles and some of those circles were particularly influential in further spreading his idea. The person he posted to, whose, uh, whose circle is represented in the bottom right, then shared it beyond to a number of other circles. And in the same way, if you want to change people's thinking, you need to understand who in your camp is going to be able to help you spread your ideas in this kind of way. So thinking about your network, your camp, if it looks like this, that's going to be great for for the sharing and the sticking of ideas, but you're not going to have very much influence outside that small and relatively close-knit group. On the other hand, if, you're, if your structure is more like this, it's sparse, it's diverse, access to lots of different perspectives, and the potential to spread your ideas, but you also need to understand who can help your ideas stick. So, in conclusion, think about your core, your clique, your camp, and, and who's in your crowd. It's okay to have more than 150 people on Facebook, but realistically, we know some relationships are more meaningful than others. So be aware who's in your crowd of 150, and that's where you channel your attention naturally. Use applications like Touchgraph to visualize your network. It's fun, and it illuminates your social world in a different way, but be mindful of the fact that there are very important people in, in life who aren't necessarily the ones most connected and most active on Facebook. Think about your camp, think about the structure of the relationship within your camp. Is it sparse? Is it diverse? Who's out there promoting your ideas? And think about whether that structure is one that you might 
be able to influence by bridging new connections and making new, especially as you go forward from school into university, your camp is going to be quite a, a fluid and dynamic thing. You will retain friendships from here, but you will also start to create new camps. And that fluidity in who we refer to in terms of who we listen to and who we spread ideas to is a natural part of our social lives. I think we're at a point where our, our thinking about our networks is going to change. I think the last 10 years have been a time when we have been able to move our social networks online and connect with people online. I think the next 10 years are going to be a time where we can use technology to really understand the connections within our networks and think about how to use those to generate and spread ideas. Thank you. <laughs>